CYC is a free channel that presents the Word of God for everyone. Your support will help us to continue the mission. Visit our website, cycnow.com. Even a dollar will make a difference. Hi everyone and welcome back to our session on evolution and creation. I uh, just want to welcome you all here today. We have our guests Miriam and Miro and Eva and Monica. So welcome to you all. Why don't you just tell us uh, where you're from? I believe you're all from the same church. Yeah, we're all from the Church of St. Mary and St. Athanasios in Mississauga, Canada. Excellent. Mississauga is part of Toronto, right? Just in case people didn't know. It's in the GTA. Okay. It's in the greater <laughs> Toronto area. Yeah. Excellent. So my name is Don Waller, and I'm your host for these sessions. And uh, I'm also born in uh, Waterloo and also Canadian. Um, I work with an organization called Reasons to Believe, and uh, it's an organization that seeks to find uh, harmony between science and faith. And in previous sessions, we've been looking at uh, the standard model for the origin of life, what your average textbook will tell you about the origin of life. And we're, gonna, we're asking questions all the way through these sessions about what those predictions are of that model and does it make any sense in terms of what we actually see when we look at the earth around us. So we've talked about the timing of early life and the conditions of early life. We talked about the complexity of early life and we talked about this fancy thing called homochorality, the, the, the shape of molecules and how it, how it seems that all of life's uh, biomolecules um, seem to only have one, one shape, not the other one as we'd expect. They're all left-handed and not, there's no right-handed ones. So in this session, we're gonna talk about the chicken and egg challenge. And uh, I'll explain what the chicken and egg challenge is as we go along. So first we're gonna do just a little bit of review on some chemistry, okay? You're gonna, if you're not interested in chemistry, please don't go to sleep, but we'll go through this really fast. You've all heard of DNA, right? Okay, give your heads a, a nod there. I know you're still with me. All right, so we've heard of DNA. So in order for DNA to work, it has to be able to replicate itself. Notice it has to be able to duplicate itself, right? So this is a process we call replication. Um, once the DNA has been replicated, something called transcription happens. It's where the DNA molecule gets red, like a tape, and uh, it produces RNA and messenger RNA. That messenger RNA then gets translated into proteins, okay? It gets red and proteins come out. And those proteins go through a number of changes and we end up with all the components of a cell that we see in the world today. Now that's a very simple explanation and I apologize to all the PhDs in biochemistry out there <laughs> that are watching this, uh, but this gives us just a very high level view of what happens inside your average cell. And we know that this DNA is this double helix design. Uh, it has this sugar background and back, and backbone with a bunch of uh, molecules called nucleotides sticking out. And those things actually give the information aspect to the DNA molecule. Those are the things that the order in which we see them, the C's, the A's, the T's, and the G's, tell, tells the cell what to do. It's the instruction set for the cell. Those series of letters that we saw give rise to amino acids and the sequence of amino acids and those grow and get bigger into proteins, large proteins, including enzymes, which are the catalysts of the cell, the proteins that make the chemical reactions of the cell go faster. And basically here's a picture just of a normal animal cell, so-called normal, but as you can see from the picture, it's really complicated in there all kinds of things going on. And uh, many people today, you can actually see on the, on the internet, there's live action video available of, of models of cells, what's going on inside. And uh, you'd be forgiven for thinking that it's like a miniature factory because that's exactly what the cell is. It takes raw materials in, it does something with those raw materials, it gets rid of waste, it does all this, and it's with an amazing amount of complexity. Okay, so here's the question. Or here's the issue, rather, that origin of life researchers struggle with. So DNA replication and transcription and translation and all these things are catalyzed by a number of enzymes. I mentioned that. 
takes proteins in order to make all those things happen with the DNA and the RNA. But those proteins are actually coded for by the DNA itself. So if the DNA actually codes for the enzymes that are needed in order for it to duplicate itself, then how did the DNA ever come into existence? You with me? Mm -hmm. So it's a classic chicken and egg problem, but with a mind-boggling degree of complexity. Mm -hmm. And so this is something that's a serious challenge, I think, for anyone looking at the evolution of life to explain how DNA, which is a molecule that needs proteins, could ever even come into existence because without proteins, where would it have started? Here's a, a quote from Leslie Orgel, who passed away recently. He said that it would be a miracle if a strand of RNA ever appeared on the primitive Earth. Now, he still believed that it did because he was a naturalist and believed that only natural processes can explain the origin of life. But he was willing to concede that it would have been a miracle for that to happen. All right. We're going to talk now about the Cambrian explosion. And we talked about this in an earlier session, You'll, you may recall. Some of you were here. And we want to talk a little bit more detail about this because it's a, a real challenge in terms of origin of life. Because with the Cambrian explosion, we see complexity of life really ramp up. It goes from fairly simple, so-called simple, it was still complex as we've already seen, but it goes into a huge amount of complexity and abundance, a lot more life forms seem to appear. So let's talk about the Cambrian explosion. It happened about 543 million years ago, and at this time, over 70 complex animal phyla. Now, a phyla is a group of animals that have the same body structure, okay? You should know this from your biology classes. Over 70 complex animals suddenly and simultaneously appeared during a two to three million year window. Okay. Only 30 of these are left on Earth. None of the new 30 are new. In other words, there's no new phyla in the past 500 million years. No new body structure. Everything that came into existence that ever has happened in 543 million years ago in terms of this, these animal phyla. Only 30 are left. So it seems as though evolution, if it's true, if naturalism is true, it seems to be going the wrong way because there aren't as many left as there were. And it's a real challenge to explain how this sudden burst of, of animal structures could simultaneously and suddenly appear on planet Earth through natural means. Now, I'm not just saying that. Let's look at a few scientists in terms of what they said. So here's Richard Dawkins, famous biologist, uh, a man who's not shy about uh, telling the world that he's an atheist. He said this, the Cambrian strata of rocks, vintage about 500 million years, are the oldest ones which we find most of the major invertebrate groups. And we find many of them already in an advanced state of evolution, the very first time they appear. It is as though they were just planted there without any evolutionary history. Now, that's an amazing quote, I think. So he's basically acknowledging that, yeah, when we look at the fossil record, they just are there. Bang. There's no progression. There's no gradually they got more and more complex. Gradually we see all these animals appearing. It's just bang. There it is. Here's a quote from Kevin Peterson, also an evolutionary biologist. He said, Although the Cambrian explosion is of singular importance to our understanding of the history of life, it continues to defy explanation. In other words, we can't explain it. We don't know. But it is amazing. Okay. So let's move on to our last item of our, of our uh, seven on the list. And we're going to talk a little bit about the genetic code. I'm going to talk to you in a little more detail. We touched on it with our chemistry of life slide. But we're going to go back now and we're going to talk in a little more detail about DNA. Now, DNA is really cool. I mean, even if you just read the newspaper today and, you know, read your average magazine, most people have heard of DNA. 
and you know people talk about well it's in the dna of our organization or you know it's the dna of our family that we do this and everybody uses this word dna you know even if they haven't a clue what they're talking about um, so it's it's commonly understood as the sort of blueprint you know it's the thing that drives everything else right and to a large degree that's true so let's talk about this so the first thing we want to look at is that is the idea of information okay information so can we agree that information comes from intelligence? If you were to, to just, I don't know, take a series of random processes and just let them go crazy, do you think you're going to get information out of that? If you think about anything you know of that you would call information, um, it had to come from some kind of intelligence. Is mm -hmm. that right? Yeah. yeah. So, so if we can agree on that, we can then look at what about coded information? What if it's secretly coded, right? Would that require even more intelligence to do that? You, probably, okay? What if those codes were actually overlapped with other codes so that you had to know the code for the code before you knew what the information was? That would be way cool, right? Well, this isn't so far-fetched. You guys all know what secret, you've seen secret word codes, right? So you take letter A, A is for, you know, is uh, coded for the number 29, and B is 33, and C is 7. Is, and so you could create a secret message to your girlfriend in school, and you could pass it over saying, you know, see you after school or whatever, all written in numbers. And the teacher caught you with that note and said, you know, what is this? You know, you'd say, oh, nothing, you know. Why would, he, why would you be able to say that? Because he doesn't know the code, see? And the code, if he had the code, he'd be able to interpret those numbers and say, oh, look, you're trying to arrange something after school or whatever, right? You with me? Secret word code. Happens in grade three all the time, right? When <laughs> Susie falls in love with, with, uh, with Joey. All right. You've probably all seen this, the universal product code or UPC. You guys seen these little, you know, bar things? And what happens? The guy comes up mm -hmm. with, the, with the ray gun and goes, boop, you know, and, you know, go to Walmart and that's all you hear all day. Boop, 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 boop. Everything's going through the scanner. What's it reading? It's reading this UPC code, right? Just a series of stripes and everything. But somehow the computer seems to know that that section of stripes means this article and this price, right? Okay, you with me so far? Mm -hmm. Well, this is the genetic code. The genetic code is basically you've got four letters. That's it. Just imagine four letters. Now, these are nucleotides, like I explained earlier. They're special, you know, molecules. But basically, think of the, the, the four nucleotides as four letters, C, A, U, and G, okay? Those four nucleotides, those four letters, are all the information, that's the, that's the, the alphabet, if you like, for the entire information set for all of life, everywhere. Those four letters. That's all you need. From those four letters, we get all the amino acids, which make all the proteins that exist. And I won't go into the details of how the code works, but uh, basically you go out, it's a three letter code, you put three together, three letters beside each one, and you get an amino acid. And there's a number of really cool things about the code I won't go into, but uh, a guy by the name of Marshall Nirenberg received the 1968 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for discovering that this three-letter code language of the genetic code existed. And uh, he died in January uh, 2010. So I'm not going to go into too much detail on this, but just to give you a kind of an overview of this genetic code and to try and impress on you this, that this information we're talking about is so incredibly complex. So the genetic code produces 64 words which code for the 20 amino acids that exist in all proteins and living organisms. Now, mutations occur when the DNA isn't read right. Okay, We all know mutations can, can occur. We see that. Now, recent research on the genetic code is revealing that this code is incredibly optimized in order to reduce those errors. In other words, if it was a two-letter code, you would have got a lot more errors. If it was a four-letter code, you would have got a lot more errors. But because it's a three-letter code, it's the best possible code that could exist. 
Indeed, the genetic code has been shown to possess more error minimization capacity than any other conceivable set of rules that could have been used to construct the code. Now, remember, according to the naturalist model, all of that happened through natural processes. There was no intervention, there was no intelligence involved. It just happened that way. Does that make any sense whatsoever? So, the last thing I want to talk about with this genetic code thing is something that's really, really recent. This just happened last year. A really big project called the ENCODE project, which stands for the Encyclopedia of DNA Elements. Don't worry about that. But it was started by the U.S. National Human Genome Research Institute. And basically what these guys have discovered is that they thought they understood how DNA worked. But what they've understood now is, is that there are codes on top of codes on top of codes. And that the whole system of how genes are expressed, how we get proteins out of living cells, is way more complicated than anyone could have imagined. It's not just even as simple as three letters. It's much more than that. Okay. Um, so let's, let's come back to where we started. We had this uh, predictions at the beginning of our talk last session where we talked about, all right, so if the textbook model of life is, is correct, what would it predict? So we're going to work through these. So the first prediction was that life emerged slowly. Emerged slowly. And I think we're over time. Sorry, I just noticed. I'm at 16 and I need to get through the rest. We should have stopped. And we'll use the last session to, to, to finish it off. Okay, so we've been talking about the genetic code and this, this uh, chicken and egg problem. What came first, uh, you know, DNA or proteins? But you need proteins to make DNA, so how did that work? And we've looked at the complexity of the genetic code. So does anyone have a question around some of this material that we've been looking at? Yes. Um, seeing the evidence of the complexity of the DNA, during, even during the earliest form of life, how do uh, naturalists defend their beliefs? Oh, well, that's a great question. I think that, um, again, it comes back to what we talked about in some of our previous sessions, and that is, how strong is your worldview? So it's really not just a question of looking at the science, but it's a question of how do you look at the scientific work you're doing? So if a naturalist is committed to the view that only natural explanations are permitted in science, and there's no way that the idea or concept of a designer on some kind of super intelligent designer is allowed or possible, even if the evidence seems to support that, they'll just continue to argue that, you know, we don't know, but we're going to find an answer. Um, there's a persistence to say that somehow, some way, naturalism will find the answer. We just need more time. So that's the typical response. That, uh, that one gets. All of this research is great because it, it does help us to understand uh, the complexity of life. And no one who has a theistic worldview, a belief in God, has any problem with any of the things that are being discovered because they fit in with a biblical worldview. But the challenge, I think, for the naturalist is that it's very difficult to explain some of these problems that we've been looking at using only naturalistic mechanisms. Okay, so thanks very much, guys. Great session today, and we'll see you in the next session.